Where are my cigars, Bobby? Oh. Bueno, muy buenas tardes. Are you ready? Muy buenas tardes a todos. Eh, este es el webinar eh, organizado por la División Neurocirugía y la Sección Neurooncología mm. en el Hospital de Clínicas. Eh, agradecemos en primer lugar la presencia del doctor Micho Erger, figura mundial en el tema de gliomas, eh, y también la presencia de todos ustedes. Y bueno, este, lo dejo con el organizador, el doctor Roberto Saninovich. Fabi. Uh, well, uh, hello, my name is Bobby Saninovich. I'm a brain surgeon. I'm a neurosurgeon from the University of Buenos Aires. Uh, and along with Dr. Rodolfo Recalde, uh, who is also a neurosurgeon, and Dr. Diego Pros, who is the neurooncologist, will uh, coordinate this webinar. Also, we have a panel of uh, experts neurosurgeons uh, that will help us in, in developing this webinar. Um, we have today the great pleasure and honor to have as a speaker to Dr. Mitch Berger. Everyone knows who is Mitch Berger in this field. Uh, but again, Dr. Berger uh, is the chairman and professor of the Department of Neurological Surgery and director of the Brain Tumor Center uh, at the University of California in San Francisco. So uh, everyone, uh, it's really anxious to hear Dr. Berger, but first I want to make one second uh, a thankful uh, day for Dr. Armando Vaso, who is here with us. And Dr. Vaso, you want to say some little words, please? Bueno, lo voy a decir, lo voy a decir en español, entonces. Uh, eh, okay. Porque el... Eh, oh. I can say that in English, so, okay. The problem of uh, the, the management and treatment of, of gliomas was in the history, something that, uh, that uh, is a doubt of, uh, of neurosurgery for, for, for people, because during the last 40 years, uh, not, not much advance has been done, but in the last, in the last years, the last year, because uh, thanks to the, the development of images, to the development of, uh, of function images, to the development of uh, molecular biology mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, and, and um, um, another, another basic science was possible really to advance. Uh, and because we have better images, we can develop some mm -hmm. special and, and, and advances surgical technique. Mm. So I think the idea of organize this symposium of uh, what's new, what's new in, the, in gliomas is a fantastic idea. And we have the, the honor and have uh, Mitch Berger here and also my friend, James uh, Rutka and, and, and Dr. Dufour from France for, for Montpellier. So thank you for coming, uh, Dr. Berger. And yeah. we are, we are, we would like to hear you, uh, really. And uh, welcome to Argentina. Uh, and, you know, very special, special circumstances uh, in the world. Thank you very much for yeah. coming. Well, well, thank you, Armando. It's a pleasure, pleasure. I hope you can hear me okay. Yes, yes, I hear you. And, um, it's a great pleasure to be able to do this and to join many good friends, uh, to see you again, to see you in good health. And uh, you're looking great. I'm thrilled about that. That's wonderful. And I, I hope all of you and your families are well during this very difficult time that we've yes, all experienced uh, here. It's been very, very challenging. and in our world to carry on with our work. Um, I would just say that um, we continue to struggle with our ability to take care of patients. We have tremendous restrictions put on us in terms of what we can do and what we can't do. I think this is probably true for my colleagues in France and in Canada. Um, we've been hit particularly hard but we have to remember 
we were the first city in the United States to go into lockdown. We were the first state to go into lockdown. New York followed us three weeks later, and you can see the difference in what happened. So even though many of us felt this was the wrong thing to do early on, um, I think for our state, it turned out to be the right thing because in a state of 40 million people, we've had less than 4,000 deaths. So oh my God. as tragic as it is, it's uh, been under reasonable control. So, yeah, right. Well, great. Yeah. Great. Yeah, thank, thankfully, yes. Thanks, God. Everything is under control. Yeah. Now. Right. And as I was, and I, and as I was thinking about all of the trouble we've had and all of the challenges we've had, um, I started thinking about my own career because um, I had no idea whether or not it would be cut short or whether we would be uh, forced. There was a time where some of us over the age of 65 were forced to not even show up at the hospital. Um, now they've let us come back in even over 65. And uh, so there was a very precarious time. So as I was thinking about this, I started thinking about uh, my career and what I've done. And I thought it would actually be an appropriate thing for this lecture to talk about the journey that I've taken in brain mapping. And I say this because, of course, in glioma surgery, we have many different adjuncts that we've all used through the years. Um, and one of the things that has been the most helpful to me has been the mapping strategy that we've used. And I want to just show you how I came to do this. I thought it would be an interesting personal story in light of, you know, the feeling that I, in mid-March, I kind of realized that maybe I would not be able to do this anymore, or perhaps, um, as we worked in the hospital, we would contract COVID and we would have problems with it. So anyway, that's why I, I built this lecture around that. So let Perfect. me just, yeah. So, <clears throat> so let me just um, go forward with this. Sure. And I think this is a very appropriate slide. Armando will certainly remember both Charlie Wilson and George Ogerman, um, who have been very influential in this field, but in different ways. And when I was making the transition from a resident, and you can see me here as a resident, when I studied with Charlie Wilson um, many years ago, uh, I realized that his whole uh, process of which he developed was the, the idea of going in and being as radical of a surgeon as possible, but not paying attention to function. And because of some of the problems I saw with that, I had the opportunity just by, by luck when I was at the University of Washington to meet George Ogerman and sit down and talk with him about the work he was doing in epilepsy. And I realized that it was it would be a very difficult um, process, I think, to use the epilepsy techniques in brain tumor surgery because epilepsy is primarily a, a procedure developed for surface anatomy, meaning you try to remove cortical neurons or neuronal regions that excite or promote epilepsy. And in brain tumors, we're dealing with subcortical regions that are so important for uh, the functions that we deal with and yet the ability of tumor cells to spread. So how is I going to bring the two of these things together? And, and at that point in time, when I started off at the University of Washington in my career, um, I was struggling a little bit because there wasn't really a lot of information about brain mapping and what its utility or use would be for glioma surgery. So 
I would say the information was very sparse and there were a few publications and these are the only publications I could really find as it related to glioma surgery and cortical mapping prior uh, to when I started at this time. So there wasn't a lot of information to go on. And so historically, I, I learned other things from other people. And I go back to when I was an undergraduate at Harvard University. I remember um, as a neuropsychology major going to hear Dr. Geshwin talk about language organization. And it was a very fascinating uh, time in my life as a young student. I didn't realize that it would have a profound effect on me later on, but it, it was the first time that someone came forth and really put teeth into the concept that there was connectivity, that there were different localizations in the cortex that were connected underneath the surface that resulted in the complex nature of speech and language. And the only way we learned about this was through traumatic injuries and autopsies and strokes and autopsies. And we had no imaging during this time. So to, pro to actually come up with a theory that there was a pathway um, that connected one region with one function like Broca's region to Wernicke's area for comprehension was very radical at the time. And I didn't realize this, but I think it was the substrate for understanding the concept of plasticity. And I think this is something that early in my career, I didn't really appreciate very much. And, and I was uh, lucky enough to have a long-term association with Hugh Defoe and as a friend and a colleague and somebody who during his early years of learning this came to Seattle. We had many discussions together. And of course, he was the one that I think really proved that plasticity exists in the adult brain, especially in tumors where there are slow growing processes. And of course, then we have the Canadian contribution of Wilder Penfield. And, and that contribution came back to me through one of my professors called Edwin Boldry, Boldry was a neurosurgeon and a chairman at the University of California. And he together, when he was with Penfield, did some of the early electrical stimulation studies, mapping the brain and came up with some of these early maps that you see that he so nicely elucidated in the early, or I would say the early 1950s and subsequently beyond that. So these were the leaders at the time. This is all we knew. We knew that there was functional localization in certain regions of the cortex. We knew that there were subcortical connections. And yet we had no idea to image this. We didn't know how to map it at a subcortical level. And so began the process of learning as we go. And, and during this time in my life, I also realized that I was very committed to patient safety as we all are as neurosurgeons. And, and uh, when I was president of the WNS and my dear colleague, Jim Rutka, who was president before me, um, we had the opportunity to devote part of our meeting to what our passion was. And certainly my passion had to do with safety. And I think it's another reason why I got into the brain mapping technique. The other thing that I've learned um, you know, throughout my career is that we must, we must develop a process where we continually assess our ability to achieve our goals. And one of my goals was to maximize extent of resection while minimizing morbidity. And recently I wrote an article with one of my residents on this where I went back and looked at my learning curve and realized that as I got older and more experienced, I learned more. I did not become worse at achieving my goal. I became better. You know, there are certain 
professions like professional sports, you peak in your late twenties and early thirties and that's it. But in, in surgery, as long as you have your health and your stamina and your cognitive abilities, you can continue to contribute. And that's really what life is all about. And I think Armando is a great example of someone who's dedicated his life to making important discovery and contributions in the field of neurosurgery. That's why he is internationally renowned for his contributions throughout the years. He's a legend in neurosurgery and it's, it's a real pleasure for me to have him participate in this webinar. So I'm sure he would have the same learning curve as I did over time. The other thing that uh, became clear to me as the years went on is that people like myself and like Hugh Defoe who got into mapping were obviously better at teaching these techniques than other people who did not have the experience. So how were we gonna prove that? Well, what we did was we published this paper last year about the extent of resection, how you could predict how good you were going to do if you were trained by someone who was very good at it, who specialized in this area versus those who were not specialized in this area. And again, to make a very long story short, if one of us, myself or Defoe or others who were senior level people we're teaching our junior faculty, people like my colleague, Sean Jumper now, who's will eventually take over my practice in brain mapping and other young surgeons. Uh, Bobby, I don't consider you uh, a young surgeon, but you're somewhere a lot younger than me. <laughs> but um, you know, the reality is that if I'm teaching that person how to do these resections with mapping, that they become better at it sooner. And so therefore, as you can see, the ability to predict and achieve extent of resection at a junior level is greater from those individuals who are instructed by those of us who have gone through the learning curve and have a greater experience. So it, it, that was a very interesting lesson to learn and to emphasize the needs that we should you know, teach the next generation what we've learned and continue to do that as long as we possibly can. So in pursuing this whole avenue of approach, it occurred to me that there were two reasons why I was doing this. One is that I wanted as a tumor surgeon to be very aggressive to determine whether extent of resection affects outcome. And I'm gonna show you at the end of this lecture, a study that we just published in the journal of the American Medical Association, a study which begins a journey for me at the end of my career to look at all different grades of gliomas in the molecular era to see whether extent of resection still is important based upon molecular classification of tumors. So on the one hand, I decided early in my career that I was gonna be an aggressive surgeon. On the other hand, I didn't wanna hurt anybody. So my goal was to maximize extent of resection, minimize morbidity, and hopefully contribute to overall survival for patients who had gliomas and not impact negatively the quality of their life. And, and of course, we have lots of tools in glioma surgery. And as much as we use all of these different tools, all of them essentially share the same concept that it's about identifying tumor, either macroscopically or microscopically and trying to ablate it or remove it. But none of these techniques other than mapping takes into consideration the physiological nature of the lesion we're going to remove or the brain around it. So stimulation mapping has become, I think more important than anatomy or methods to determine anatomy during surgery, even microscopically using 
Raman microscopy, things that we've been doing here. Um, you know, nothing's more important than understanding the function of the tumor you're going to take out. And to do that, of course, brain mapping has served a great purpose. Now, the problem with brain mapping, and it's something that, again, it, this is a, I'm, I'm describing a journey that I've taken. And the journey that I've taken is to learn, certainly from my mistakes as well as from my successes. And this was an article that I think made my career go down a certain pathway. And it was the fact that during this initial series of patients that we published in 1989 on the, on the localization of language in the human brain, we realized that there were no two patients alike, that there was tremendous individual variability in language localization, which means that we had to map each patient one at a time. And what also what it meant was that if a patient spoke Spanish and English, that we had to map each language separately. It was a very important concept that I didn't understand initially. And my initial assumption was incorrect. And that was that if I found more than one site in the brain for language, the same function like the ability to name an object, I thought that maybe I could take those sites out. If I left one, that one would compensate. And I learned early on in my career that that was a mistake, that there is redundancy to a point, but that these centers, these other centers that have the same function are all important in the process. And you can't take one and rely on the other one that's going to take over. I'll come back to this concept in a bit. So of all the things I learned, this was the most important thing I learned, that there was variability in localization. And that goes to people who have more than one language. There is variability in language localization for a given function in Spanish or English or no matter what language that individual speaks. So in other words, if I were to find a site that allowed an individual to name an animal in English, I don't necessarily have to assume that that same site is going to name the same animal in Spanish. There may be another site for that. And we think a lot of that depends on when people learn their second language, meaning the earlier they learn their second language, the more likely they are to have different sites for the same function in different languages. The other point I learned from this study was that I was under the assumption early on that I needed to always have a positive site to rely on my mapping. And although this continues to remain, I won't say a controversy, it just remains an issue where some of us have different approaches to this. Um, I have changed my practice and now I do much more focused exposures because if I don't find a language site on the surface, I feel more comfortable removing those negative sites. Um, but I'm not saying that that's the gold standard by any means. It's just the way I've done it and it's worked for me based on a study that I'll show you. Um, the finding of variability in speech localization, uh, I've been able to prove this after we wrote that article in 1989 with an article we wrote in 2016 because over the years I was able to save all of those functional targets with navigation and then go back and look at variability of these sites. So for example, if I want to look at the variability of finding speech arrest based upon a heat map, of course, you would expect to see this more likely to be located in an area we refer to as Broca's region. Now we'll, again, we'll, we'll prove that Broca's region is not really an essential component of language. And I'll come back to this with a study that we've recently done and we'll present at the Congress meeting if we ever have a Congress meeting. Um, and then anomia, same thing. There's a very high likelihood of finding 
anomia in certain areas, but you can find stimulation induced naming arrest in other locations as well, not just in the region overlying Wernicke's area. So I think the concept of language variability remains very, very important for us in this field of doing brain tumor surgery. And we have to take that into consideration. This was the article that convinced me that it would be okay to do a more focused exposure and to test areas where many times, sometimes 100% of the times we test one small region, say five millimeters or eight millimeters on the surface, we don't see a function, um, you know, no problem. I, I think that in this setting, I have no problems removing a site that's negative if I have not found any positive sites. And I'll show you examples of what I'm talking about as we go on. But this is, this is the school of thought that says negative language mapping can be relied upon. I think there are different schools of thought, primarily the French school of thought um, that Hugh has said for many, many years that there is no such thing as negative language mapping. And I, I think what he's trying to say is that, you know, he has always relied on finding a positive site, doing a more extensive map. And I have absolutely no problem with that concept whatsoever. It's just, I'm here to tell you that if you rely on a negative site, that the likelihood of a permanent deficit by removing a negative site without finding a positive site is still very, very, very low, meaning 2% or less. And this has stood the test of time um, throughout my career. The other thing I would say in case anybody is interested in thinking about this is what happens in the non-dominant hemisphere. Now, let me back up and say that the right hemisphere is not necessarily non-dominant. There's no such thing as dominant and non-dominant. But what I really mean to say is that in somebody who's left-handed, who turns out to have primary language function for naming, for example, or expressive speech in the right hemisphere, that when we've done maps of the right hemisphere, they're identical in terms of localization as we see in right-handed individuals on the left side. So there is no difference in that in case anybody was interested. And then I think the other um, message here, you know, before I show you some examples and some other lessons that I've learned is that after surgery, it's not unusual to have deficits. And this is a beautiful example of an article that we published a few years ago showing that in all of these functions, when we resect tumor, in these areas, and we have fairly normal functions on the left side of these graphs, within a few days, all of these patients do very poorly because of shift, because of swelling, that's to be expected. But if we rely on our information and we do not remove a positive site, the likelihood of these functions all improving is very, very reliable. And usually by one month, we're there and certainly based on the New England Journal article I showed you, we can reliably predict where we're gonna be post-operatively by three months. We don't have to wait for a year or six months. We can predict the deficit profile then. So what does this all mean? This, this is an article that many of us put together as a review saying that if you're going to remove an, a glioma it is critical that you use stimulation mapping because you can reduce the deficit risk by 50%. And so now the gold standard or the standard of care in, in brain tumor surgery for gliomas is to do functional mapping. And these, um, these cases are done typically with patients awake. Um, I think this is when I was at the height of my work now I'm down to, in the COVID, post-COVID era, I'm down to maybe one case a week only. Whereas before I was doing three to four cases of awake surgery, but 
you know, most patients are not allowed to travel. Uh, we also have a very strict visitation policy here and there are no visitors. So patients don't feel comfortable coming to the hospital. So we're really stuck. So our, our volume has significantly dropped and hopefully things will improve. But this has my, been my experience over a, a very long period of time of, at the two centers I've worked in. And there have been a number of important considerations. I'm not going to go through all of these issues, but suffice it to say that the standard that I tend to use is an asleep approach without any kind of intubation or laryngeal mask. I wake the patient up, I do the mapping. If they're not having any problems, I keep them awake. And then I continue with the surgery and then I put them to sleep for the closure. And that's essentially how I've done things for many, many years. And as time has gone on, as you've seen this slide before at seminars, we've come up with different ways to minimize the problems with mapping or deficits from mapping. Like uh, when we're awake and patients are having stimulation mapping, sometimes that can provoke seizure activity. And many years ago, I wrote an article using iced cold ringer solution to abort the seizure activity. And that's stood the test of time and has worked very, very well. So again, it's the sleep awake, asleep technique where we expose just the area we're going to expose. We map the functions we're interested in mapping, such as motor speech, naming function, comprehension, reading, looking at semantic processing versus phonological processing, visual pathways. It just depends where you are and what you're interested in doing. And the mapping technique is very versatile cortically and subcortically. And we use these anesthetic regimens now with dexamethetomidine and a short acting narcotic typically. This is how we do our work primarily. In the COVID era, we've had tremendous um, shortages of propofol and dexamethetomidine because of patients on ventilators, which have to be used to sedate patients. And this has also interfered with our elective abilities to do awake surgery. Okay, so that's the evolution of the technique. And the point I was making is that instead of doing these big exposures now, I rely on some very, very small exposures to get to where I'm getting to. And at times uh, you have to be flexible. You have to change the drugs that you use. So I didn't know this at the beginning of my career, but as my career evolved, I was able to realize that in nearly half of the cases I ever did before I made a skin incision, I'd have to change the anesthetic regimen because the patient was not comfortable using one regimen versus the other. So you just need to be flexible and still at this day and age, uh, especially with ice water irrigation, our risk of stimulation induced seizures is very, very, very low and it. We never have to abort or stop an operation because of that, which is good news. And in my experience, even at the level of over 1500 cases, and I'll probably uh, soon put together my latest experience in awake surgery with I've been waiting till I get to about 2000 cases. So it's going to take a little bit more time. Um, but the deficit rate has remained around 2% for permanent deficits. Um, and this is a paper that we have um, coming out in the Journal of Neuroimaging. It actually just came out not that long ago, which looks at a strategy to understand how to predict the deficits that occur after surgery. So when patients fall into the category where early on they're having deficits and they're not getting better, in all of these cases, we now do tractography. And we see some very interesting things here. We can now sort out whether we've actually resected part of the pathway such as here where I actually resected the IFOF because my stimulation capabilities 
we're obviously not robust enough to pick up a subtle damage at that time. So in other words, when I stimulated just this portion of the IFOF, I did not have any stimulation induced deficit. So I went ahead and did a resection that included just this one portion, which resulted in a deficit in semantic, causing semantic paraphasias. Now, luckily, it wasn't a complete loss of the ability to form those sentences with proper semantics because I did not resect the entire tract. And in fact, in this patient, the deficit was fairly mild, but it explained to me early on why the patient had a deficit when I stimulated intraoperatively and did not find it because I had resected part of that tract. Usually when the stimulation involves a much wider part of a tract, we can always pick up a deficit and avoid causing an injury. But when you have to be careful because sometimes when you're on the periphery of a tract, you may not always see the deficit but the deficit that you're going to have for resecting just a part of it is not going to be as great as if you took out the entire tract. So this is a new strategy we're using to try and define our injuries better and predict recovery of function. This is an article that's going to come out soon in the Journal of Neuro-Oncology. I, I, I just put it up because I think it points out that when we look at the entire evidence of what's out there in awake surgery. This was a review article of all the cases that have been done with well over a couple thousand cases in the literature. I think you get the impression that it's evolved into a very safe approach in the modern era, meaning in those studies that have been published in the last 15 years, the permanent deficit rate remains fairly low. Now, again, it varies and it varies on the technique that's used for that individual. So in my experience, that deficit rate in all these functions, whether it's motor or language has been relatively low and acceptable. And the deficits that I've had have been largely ischemic in nature and not tracked injuries. But in these articles, where you look at permanent deficit rates, there is no way to quantify what the deficit was due to because they don't have post-operative diffusion weighted images or diffusion tractography. So it just shows you this is a, still a very complicated field, but in essence, the deficit rate has been pretty darn good. And again, as I show you these cases, I just wanted to show you from this article, the flow in our operating room of doing these cases, we're probably very similar in your operating room where we have our surgeons in this position, our mapping team here, our stimulator systems behind us, our recording folks here, as well as our navigational systems here. We don't have intraoperative MRI scans, um, so we don't have this in the equation. But again, remember function for me, function's more important than anatomy, but this is the general setup in the room. And these are the basic principles. We talked about cold water irrigation, where we're irrigating the cortex to prevent seizures. We talk about the regional field blocks we use to expose the cortex, infiltrating the middle meningeal artery to avoid pain. The, the paradigms that we use, naming paradigms, reading paradigms. And then we do different things. Now we've learned over the years, and again, based upon injuries that have occurred with subcortical resections, we've learned that there are ways to identify subcortical language pathways. So this was an article we published last year showing how we now do this. And the reason, the way we do this is we use a simple test where we look at a picture word interference where we show patients this and we ask them to tell us 
what the related word is. In this case, these are two animals versus an animal and a fruit. And by doing this during stimulation, we can avoid causing injuries to the ventral stream like the IFOF, which would result in a semantic paraphasia. This simple test, which is sentence generation, has been most useful in the subcortical pathway of the dorsal stream, such as the SLF or the arcuate fasciculus, in which stimulation of those pathways results in phonological paraphages, which is a hallmark of a dorsal stream injury. So based on naming, reading, talking, meaning counting through 10, sentence generation and picture word interference, I've been able to keep my deficit rates under 3%. So that explains why others maybe have it a little higher or not because they may not be using all of these tests. But for me, this has worked very well. And this is what I teach the next generation. This is the way we do subcortical language mapping, of course. I'll show you better examples of that. So in one hand, I'm simulating. In the other hand, I'm resecting because we're looking for these pathways as we go. And this has allowed us to formulate really what's important for us as neurosurgeons in terms of understanding language organization. This was an article we wrote a few years ago pointing this out with my colleague, Eddie Chang. So many indications for awake surgery. I'm going to show you maybe a couple of examples just to show you how versatile of an approach it is. I like to show these slides of tumors in the frontal lobe where we can resect these areas back to the motor cortex, uh, tumors in the temporal lobe where we can resect up to, sometimes behind the vein of LeBay, up to the sylvian fissure, tumors in the parietal region where we get into areas that have a very high risk of injuring the dorsal stream. So we have to be very careful here, once we get through the cortex, of finding subcortical systems and of course, one of my favorite areas to work in the insula because it brings everything together, such as cortical and subcortical motor language and even visual pathways. And I'll show you an example of that. So let's, let's take a look at a, an example of what we would call a typical zone one, zone four insular glioma based on our classification scheme. Um, the way I would approach this is I would take off the frontal operculum here. I'd work along the sylvian fissure. I'd take this off to expose zone one of the insula. And then I would go infrasylvian to get to the zone four component of the insular tumor. So that essentially, instead of splitting the fissure, we're going to work above and below it. Now in this case, because most of this was in zone one, we're able to do most of this work through the frontal operculum. But as I found out, as I was doing this procedure, I needed to get into the uncinate fasciculus and this required me to take off part of the superior temporal gyrus. So you, you notice in this case, of course, there's no splitting of the fissure. It's a transcortical approach into this tumor. What does this result in? Let's look at the before and after results. And you can see how this approach through the frontal operculum can get to where you want it to get to, can go around the sylvian fissure, hopefully avoid injury to the MCA branches the M2 and the M3 branches, and then do the resection you wish to do. Motor mapping has been very useful as well. And we can do this awake or asleep, and it just depends. Although I do more of this asleep than awake. In the asleep patient using bipolar stimulation, we're looking for axonal depolarization and motor movements that can be identified grossly or with 
simultaneous EMG recordings. That's been very useful. Um, subcortical stimulation, I think for me has been absolutely critical in avoiding deficits, especially around the motor pathways and now of course around the language pathways. But interestingly enough, when I published this article about a year and a half ago with over 702 cases, I continued to see that some patients where I could not find the subcortical and the cortical pathway, in particular, if I found the cortical pathway but didn't find the subcortical pathway, my incidence of a deficit was very different than if I found the cortical pathway and identified the subcortical pathway. What does this mean? It means that with bipolar stimulation mapping, you get very, very close to the subcortical pathway, sometimes too close, and this can result in an injury. So I came up with a different strategy, and this was published this month. It's online in the Journal of Neurosurgery. Um, it's not out in print yet, but it's online, came out this month, and it's called the triple motor mapping strategy. And this is a strategy where we use a combination of low frequency bipolar stimulation to identify motor pathways within millimeters of the stimulator versus high frequency monopolar stimulation at 250 hertz versus 60 hertz here to send out a wave of three centimeters or more to find the subcortical pathways deeper before you use the bipolar and then to test the entire integrity of the tract coming down through here we use transcranial magnetic stimulation with a little screw device that goes into the scalp and based upon this information we show in this article that came out using these different strategies that in this first 60 patients, we used a combination of triple motor mapping that we had only one deficit and that was a four over five deficit. So it was a very mild anti-gravity movement. The patient was walking, but had clearly a four over five strength, but in only one case out of 60. So my sense is that using this technique, I'm gonna be able to get my morbidity down to less than 1% using all three techniques. And this is a combination of adopting um, strategies I learned from Lorenzo Bello, as well as the subcortical technique I published years ago, as well as those um, who use transcranial magnetic stimulation, such as the Swiss group, Andreas Rabb, who also does monopolar stimulation as well. Um, and so here's an example of where I would want to use that technique. You see the DTI pathway, and I'm gonna go into this lesion. I'm gonna map this area, find the motor pathway, and then I'm going to stimulate um, and resect the supplementary motor area. Now, I don't have time to get into the supplementary motor area syndrome where I'm doing a study right now where we have well over 200 cases of these resections so that I'm redefining the pathophysiology of the supplementary motor area. And we hope to be able to present this at the next AANS meeting. Um, having said that, one of the prevailing theories of doing this or causing a deficit when you remove tumor in this area is to actually injure the pathways that go from the supplementary motor area to Broca's area, which is the region that we call the Aslan tract that promotes speech, motor speech. Uh, recently, and I now have several more examples of this, recently we published a paper showing that unlike what others have published, where they have stated that injury to the Aslan tract is the mechanism for the supplementary motor area syndrome, 
we have not found that to be the case. And in fact, here is proof in this patient where we've actually resected the Aslan tract on the post-operative DTI study in the patient who recovered very quickly within days and did not have a supplementary motor area syndrome. So I do not believe that this is the pathophysiology of the SMA syndrome. And we're now, as I say, within the next six months, we'll hopefully have the answer to that in a, the largest study published to date. Okay, so maybe I'll just run through this in the next 10 minutes or so, but I, I do wanna try to get to this last part about extent of resection. But I do wanna just quickly take you through some of the other lessons that I've learned of how important this technique is. So for example, when I think about going towards a tumor that's subcortically located, as you know, I have been very strongly favoring this transcortical approach. And so I'm now publishing a series of patients. This is the first one where I've taken the transcortical approach into the equator of the tumor, as opposed to going under the temporal lobe or splitting the sylvian fissure to get to it. So in other words, how would you approach this tumor? For me, the shortest distance to the equator of the tumor, which is important for an intraaxial tumor, is to go transcortical. So in order to do that, I obviously have to map language function in this region. And if I'm concerned about visual function, I need to map that as well in patients who are awake. So this is another example of a deep-seated approach where if I wanna to get to a tumor like this, I'm gonna come into this point that's closest to the surface, which happens to be very close to the motor cortex. So I'm going to find an area that's silent in the motor cortex. And as I subcortically stimulate, I'm gonna to continue to resect the tumor and subcortically stimulate as I do this. Some of you may have thought about, well, maybe you should come down through the inner hemispheric fissure and come this way in front of the motor cortex. If that's the way you feel comfortable doing it, that's fine. For me, my approach to any glioma in any location is the shortest distance between the surface and the equator of the tumor. Therefore, I consider myself a transcortical equatorial surgeon. It was very interesting. Recently, I gave a talk at the Barrow and Robert Spetzler was in, in the audience. And I remember this very lively conversation we had because he, he said exactly what I just said. He would never approach a tumor this way. He would always come down a fissure. And I said, you know, that's great. If that works for you, that works for you. If for me, this works for me and I have the post-operative morbidity to prove that I'm not causing any higher risk to the patient. And, you know, I'm glad to compare my extent of resection on gliomas with you anytime. And that drew a bit of a silence, but Robert and I, you know, he was a resident here in San Francisco and we've known each other for many years and he is, he's the anti-transcortical surgeon. He doesn't believe in that. And so we've, talked about this for many, many years, but it's very interesting. You know, this kind of approach, I showed him this case and, you know, without these lines on it. And I said, how would you approach it? And of course he would come inner hemispheric with the left side of the patient's head down towards the floor, um, you know, to let gravity do what he wanted to do. For me, I know I'm going to get at least a liter of blood loss in a case like this. This is a very vascular glioblastoma of the thalamus. So I know I'm gonna not get a complete resection because this is gonna get close to the motor tract. So for me, the safest way to get into this is transcortical equatorial. But to do this, I need to know where the language system is. So I'm gonna actually remove the inferior parietal lobule to go into this subcortically map 
get down until I find the internal capsule and stop at that point. And you know, my resection here is, is good. I'm okay with it. It's not a complete resection, but the patient walked out of the hospital three days later without a language problem, luckily, and without a motor deficit. Um, again, I don't have that in every case. 3% is the mor morbidity risk or a little bit less than that but I'm very happy to be able to use this technique without causing a vascular injury using mapping. So that, that's helpful. It's also allowed me to get the very difficult to access tumors. I think the insula is the ultimate thing that we face in terms of deep access. And again, for me, I've never really um, embraced the trans Sylvian approach. I like to come through cortex so that I don't have to manipulate these vessels, which are often encased in tumor, as you know, if you've done insular tumors. The other reason why I like to do it that way is because the lenticulostriate vessels never go through the tumor. They're just pushed on the inside of the tumor. So I'm working through these windows, I can continue to core this out until I see the lenticulostriate vessel, which you see beautifully here. And this is where you don't want to go deep to that because the likelihood is very great that this is where you will injure these mesial lenticulostriate vessels. So when I see these vessels, that's the end of the operation. So as you know, we came up with this classification system. I'm not going to go through this because when I was last in Buenos Aires, I talked about this and it was, I think this is something that you understand very well in terms of how I approach these things, showing that my ability to access regions of the tumor are greater through the transcortical approach. And sometimes quite honestly, I have to use a combination of a transcortical approach and I have to split the fissure so that I don't cause a problem with certain areas that rely on speech. So I will carry on with that. So this is a nice kind of a case where a trans Sylvian approach works very, very nicely. And it allows you to get down here. This is Dr. Lawton. When he was with me, he did this trans Sylvian approach. He was really good at this. He taught me how to do it. Um, and so now if I have to do it, I will do it using these techniques, but it gives you, for a small tumor like this, I think it's really good. And this is what it looks like afterwards. Um, so it works. I think for a bigger tumor where the tumor goes beyond this, it doesn't work. And you have to go well beyond that. Okay, so again, the reason for developing the zone classification system was to look at extent of resection and predict extent of resection based on the zone. So now I know if I have a zone one tumor, I'm very likely to get a near complete resection of that tumor. And this is an article that we published recently on my experience uh, last year in the Journal of Neurosurgery, if you're interested in doing that further. Um, a few words on plasticity. Of course, this is something I learned from Hugh's work um, I went back and looked at my cases where I have remapped those patients. And one of the things that I've tried to figure out over the years is how to predict when a patient develops plasticity. So when I operate on a patient and they have function here, and then I come back 30 months later and they, they don't have function, there's a degree of plasticity. But when does this occur? When does this loss of function in 40% of these cases occur? Well, it's difficult to know. So we're using MEG, and this is work that I've recently published, we're using MEG to um, you know, quantify this and to see if we can predict signals that are gonna tell us how this is going to go. So this is work that was recently um, published and we'll continue to use MEG to predict when plasticity occurs. Um, you know, we've talked about inoperable gliomas. I think many of these tumors come to us because they're said to be inoperable. But the reality is if we use mapping, we've been able to achieve a very nice extent of resection. 
with the mapping techniques. So when we see tumors like this that have been operated on previously that have said to have been inoperable, we can often come back and do these pretty aggressive resections using mapping strategies. This is another example where this was biopsied only said to be inoperable. It's a multicentric glioblastoma because of these activation patterns on functional imaging, which we don't use these to tell us whether something's operable or not. So when I did the mapping here, this was the previous biopsy site done elsewhere these maps were negative and because they were negative, it allowed me to go in and resect these two foci of multicentric glioblastoma. So it helps with inoperable tumors. And um, the other point I wanted to make was, you know, Broca's area, I talked about this. This is an interesting process that I've come to realize in my career, having written about language outcome after opercular resections and seeing that there are very, very few deficits that happen afterwards that didn't exist before, which indicates in situations like this, the Sylvian Fisher being here, this site causing stimulation induced speech arrest, all of these sites negative that we're able to do a resection where we remove Broca's area completely, meaning an area that caused stimulation-induced speech arrest. And um, we see that patients early on, they're very dysarthric. from one to 10? One, two, three, yeah. four. So they're very five, dysarthric, eight, but seven, they don't have speech eight, arrest. Nine. And this is a, a study that we're going to um, hopefully talk about it, the CNS meeting, <clears throat> it's an abstract we published where we looked at these resections in nearly 300 patients showing an extremely um, safe resection strategy where resecting components of the pars orbitalis triangularis and opercularis has a very, very, very low incidence of any deficits that result in speech arrest. So Broca's area tends to be a very transient planning region. We've shown this with stimulation mapping before where we can show in a patient activation of Broca's area when you, before you actually speak and excite the motor cortex. So it turns out that this is a planning area for speech and when motor cortex is active, like I'm speaking now, Broca's area tends to be very silent. And this just shows different activation patterns of the motor cortex when it's active, Broca's area is silent and vice versa. So it's like the supplementary motor area. Okay, final point I wanted to make is extent of resection. And I just wanna share this study with you because I think it's very exciting I'm in the process of completing this work for low-grade gliomas, but you know, in the past, we've relied on different extent of resections for outcomes in these patients. This is work we published with 500 gliomas, GBMs in 2011. These are from meta-analysis reviews done showing unequivocally now versus when I was a resident or, or Armando was a resident, we were told just do a biopsy, but now we know extent of resection significantly impacts outcome. So the question really is, does it matter as much in the era, era where we know IDH and MGMT? And the answer tends to be no. And this is the answer to the study. I suggest that if you're interested in February, of this year, we published in JAMA this very, very important review of all of these patients with glioblastomas where we have not only IDH data, but MGMT data. This is a typical patient population where we subtype and analyze patients who had standard IDH wild type GBM who got the stoop regimen, 
typical patients, you know, IDH wild type, most of these primary GBMs are that, half and half are methylated. So the population was pretty clear. What did it show us? It showed us that as you move along the continuum of extent of resection, you do make the most impact from 80% on. This confirms the study we published in 2011 and refuted the study that was published by the MD Anderson group that you had to do a 98% resection or better. It also shows that if you do less than a 40% resection, you don't really affect the risk of death. And if you do somewhere between 40 and 80%, you get on a plateau. You don't really affect outcome in terms of life and death. You affect more quality of life. But what's the answer with the molecular data? And so here's a perfectly good example where if you look at these patients who were IDH wild type, who had Temidar, standard patients, how can you stratify these patients? How could the same patient who's IDH wild type, regardless of MGMT, why do these patients do so much better than these patients at the bottom of this curve? And the answer I'll show you is the following. Certainly in patients who don't get Temidar, these patients who are IDH wild type, they are not gonna do very well. They're the highest risk patients in this homogeneous population, especially those patients who are over 65. Now, if you look at these patients who are less than 65, in whom you did a complete resection of the contrast tissue, and there was less than five cubic centimeters of the flare signal, ah, these are the patients that did the best. These are the patients that did the best. And then you had patients with intermediate risk who were over 65 and patients who did slightly better if they were under 65, but if they had more of the flare remaining. So what did this tell us? It told us, and we validated this with a set of patients from the Mayo Clinic and Cleveland Clinic who showed the same split of these IDH wild type patients it showed us the same thing, that regardless of IDH and MGMT status, for us now as neurosurgeons, if patients are less than 65, we must not only resect the contrast enhancing tissue, we've got to resect the non-enhancing tissue as much of it as we can, which brings me back to why we even started this whole lecture, and that was the issue of mapping because mapping allows us to push the resection margin into these safe areas. So again, this has been a long winded way of getting to the message of how this journey has evolved. But when I started my career, my goal was be aggressive, do a maximum extent of resection, try not to hurt people. And then let's see what happens at the end of that did the end justify the means? And the answer is yes. And so that's kind of where we are at this point in time. And um, as I said, hopefully this year, we will show you the data on the low grade patients in the molecular error. So I'll stop there, Bobby. Sorry, I went over a little bit, but I'll stop there. You're on mute. Bobby, you're, you you're are on mute. mute. Yeah. You're on mute. Bobby. You're on mute, Bobby. You see that little red thing there? You have to click on that. Yeah. Here click. I am. You hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks a lot. It's an excellent and superb conference, Mitch. It's really awesome. Awesome, awesome. Now we want to start with some with some question we have questions already from people uh outside argentina actually uh but there is any of our panel uh, of neurosurgeons want to start uh, with some questions i would like to i would like to say something yes uh, dear dear mitch yes uh, 
you know that you are. I now I know that you are a transcortical equatorial surgeon. Fantastic. <laughs> it's a new definition. For you. Yeah. Thank you for this outstanding uh, conference. Outstanding, really. To signalize very well for the young generation the importance of the brain mapping. This is yeah. no doubt about that. And then also, also the functional anatomy of the brain. This is, this is absolutely important now. Now, and then and then you pass all over all over your fantastic experience you have in all of, in all of this. So so I think I think the the idea because in many parts of the world. People think that they are doing good surgery if they, in myoma, if they have in the operating room a, a, an MRI, you know? Yeah. But this is not the, yes, this is, in general, people think like this. But this is, this is not what you signalize very, very well with all the details, et cetera, et cetera, the importance of the brain mapping, you know, how, how, how you perform and your results and your criteria and all those things. Really, I enjoy a lot your, Thank your you. presentation. And then I enjoy also when you show this, uh, the photo of my dear, my dear late, a great friend, Charlie Wilson, and the uh, people that died. Uh, you know, we, we were very close friends in, in the yeah. era when, when we were involved in pituitary surgery and so on. So, <laughs> so thank you, thank you again. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Fay. Thanks, Dr. Basso. And we have a, yes. uh, we have a question of uh, Dr. Adonis Mancella. And he's asking you, how long after surgery do you ask for an MRI with DTI? How long after surgery? Well, we do all of our scans within 48 hours of surgery. And at that time, we do the DTI. We don't have to do the DTI that soon, but since the patient's in the scanner, we do the DTI. Okay, perfect, perfect. Another question is, Mr. Dr. Flores is asking you, is H a limit for a maximum safe resection or depends in the Karnofsky performance status? Well, age is really not a contraindication anymore. Um, Karnofsky status is, it remains a very important predictor of the lack of benefit for patients. So if we see a patient who's got a very poor functional status, it's not really in their best interest to be able to do a big resection because the unfortunately their function is already deteriorated due to the tumor. Mm -hmm. So functional status is very important, but age is not. Perfect. Dr. Recalde wants to make a question. Rodolfo? Yes, good afternoon. Thank you very much for speaking with Berger. It was really, really amazing. Good uh, to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, two, two questions. Uh, uh, how far uh, supra-total resection do you think is logical? And the second one is, is, is very well staged, uh, the, the mapping of the language area. But how we can, or what is your, your strategy for mapping the visual area? For example, the tumor in the occipital lobe. Yeah. Well, we don't know the answer about the supertotal resection. We just, it's something that I keep asking Hugh Defoe, you know, how much is enough? And his answer is until there's a deficit. I think, though, realistically, we're going to have to go back and look at these resections. He did go back and look at his initial experience and he showed that where he made a difference was in the degree of malignant transformation, which seemed to be less, which obviously is going to translate out to survival for low grade tumors. So therefore it remains to be seen whether 10% of a supertotal resection versus 30% is going to make a difference. I don't know the answer to that. He doesn't know the answer to that. And only time will tell when he goes back and looks at his uh, experience. I do not really do super total resections. What I'll do is I always have a standard where I try to get at least a centimeter be beyond the flare. To me, that's as much of a super total resection as I'll ever do. 
as far as the GBM is concerned, it is very clear that a supertotal contrast supertotal resection is important when we go into the flare. The more flare we take out, the better these patients do from the survival point of view. And the cutoff seems to be getting out far enough so that you leave less than five cubic centimeters behind. So that's, that's not very much. You know, it's a very thin perimeter. So that's, that's the answer to your question. Doctor Trocoli, alguna pregunta? Yes, um, thank you for your time, Dr. Berger, and thank you for this amazing lecture. It's really, really amazing. Thank you. Uh, uh, you talk about the MEP monitoring, muscle monitoring during the resection of the glioma in the central area. Do you think that really improved the results um, um, taken with the, only with the cortical simulation, so cortical simulation is is really a, a new tool, a new important tool in this time of surgery? Well, I think it's, I think it is very important in terms of identifying the pathways before there's injury to them. And I have found that one of the problems with doing these kind of procedures awake is that the patients are too sensitive. In other words, as you begin to go into those pathways and move them, they lose function. And they lose function in a way that they don't lose the ability to stimulate the pathways when they're asleep. So the way I would answer your question is I think that <clears throat> the cortical and subcortical motor mapping technique is very important to find the pathways and it can be done in patients asleep and it allows you to work inside the motor cortex in a way that we before could not do. But I, I've come to realize and in talking with Lorenzo Bello about this, he does all of these now asleep. He doesn't do them awake. And uh, I made the mistake for a few years of doing more awake and I found that my resections were not optimal. So now I do them asleep and it allows me to manipulate the pathways more. And then using monopolar and bipolar stimulation, I can, the bipolar stimulation allows me to come within three or four millimeters of the pathway. So I can get pretty close. So it's a very useful technique. Yes. Okay. Thank Thanks, Dr. Chocoli. Uh, Dr. Andres Servio, Dr. Servio, you have a question? No, Bobby, thank you very much. An excellent presentation. I think all, all the items regarding glioma surgery were covered by Professor Becker. No, I appreciate your comments. It means a okay, lot. Okay, okay. And Dr. Alvaro Campero. Hello, Bobby. How are you? Hello. Hello, Alvaro. Hi. Thank you very much, Professor Berger. It was a terrific and very clear lecture, so I don't have any, any questions. Thank you very much, Professor Berger. Thank okay. you. How come none, uh, of, you, Dr. How come none of you are drinking a glass of wine? Like this one. Oh Dr. yeah. Okay. Fernandez Martinez, Dr. Fernandez Martinez Venia. No, Bobby. Uh, the lecture was okay. It was amazing. So I have no questions. Okay. Thank okay. you, Dr. Berger. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Maximiliano Nunez. Hello, doctor. Thank you for your talk. Yes, I have a, a simple question. Uh, sometimes when you when we do some surgery in the insula area, my question is: How long you, in your experience, is the recovery to the motor deficit? Uh, sometime after the surgery, what is your experience? Because sometimes we see. Uh, some temporal deficit and uh, it's very difficult for us to understand how long can be uh, with that deficit for the patient. What is your experience? Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, that's a very good question. And I think as time has gone on, I've begun to try to determine how to predict this better. Um, and the way to do that for me is 
in that post-operative scan to make sure I did not cause a stroke. So very important. And now that I have the capability, not everybody can do this, but now that I have the capability to assess the tracks, I can also confirm. So in the study we did, if we did not injure the tract and we did not have a ischemic injury, those patients got better. So to answer your question, how long does that take? Typically in those settings where you don't have ischemia or a tract injury, everybody should start to get better within three to five days. That's been my experience. As long as neither one of those exists, you say to the patient, things are gonna get better. It's going to take maybe a few more days and then they slowly start coming around and then they'll get better as time goes on because the tracks are intact, there's no ischemia. The only exception to that rule is if you have a very diffuse glioblastoma and you've left tumor in the motor tract. So you know that there is tumor in the motor tract. There's no ischemia. The tracks are still seen, but those tracks are not very functional. They're not as efficient. And just working in that area can cause them to stay out for longer, weeks. So if there's residual tumor, especially with swelling, that's a problem. Uh, can I continue with my question, please? Yeah. Um, in your opinion, when is the, the, the correct time to, to start the recovery, to kinesiologic re recovery to, for the patient, in your opinion? You mean to help them with the rehab? Yeah. Yeah, the rehab. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I think the rehab function should start as soon as they can help. So in other words, if a patient has no movement, I don't send them to rehab until I see some movement. It doesn't have to be anti-gravity. It can be just a little bit of movement here. And I send them because I know it's going to start soon. So that's what I wait for. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Maximiliano Nunez. We have uh, some questions more from people abroad. Uh, one of the questions is, Dr. Berger, what is your approach in pediatric cases where awake craniotomy is not feasible? Do you perform the surgery in two stages, first implanting electrodes and resecting in a second stage? Yeah, well, I will operate on any child I find that the age of 10, nine or 10 or higher, if I have sessions with them and I allow the parents to come into the operating room, not to see the surgery, but to be on the other side of the drape, um, I can get any nine or 10 year old or older through the operation. Anything less than that, I use a two-stage operation with a grid, but it doesn't allow you to do subcortical language mapping. So that's the only concern I have. Okay, perfect. And another question, uh, do you use on the gliadel in surgery, gliadel? No. no, we don't. I mean, I think we've been through that stage before. It's, it's had very, very modest, if at all, benefits. So we don't, we don't do it. Well, another, uh, another question from Dr. Thomas Rice. What's your experience on the use of 5-ALA? Well, 5-ALA is very, very important. I mean, we've all followed the work of Walter Stumer and others, including some of the things we published. We, we think it's very, very useful for high-grade tumors that enhance. We've tried very different methods using optical imaging technology to find this in low-grade tumors, and we haven't succeeded very well. We, we published some of that data in the Journal of Neurosurgery with my colleagues from, um, from Austria, uh, but it's not been reliable. So for high-grade tumors that enhance, we, we use it routinely. Perfect. And uh, we have two more questions. 
patients operate who have early recurrence, less than three months. Do you operate them again? Do you do surgery again? Yeah, usually no. I mean, we, we published an article which showed that when patients recur from a GBM within 12 months, that they don't tend to benefit very much from a reoperation. However, the difference now in this day and age is we have many, many more targeted therapies. So we are reoperating on patients now who recur sooner and we're sequencing the tumor. We're looking for new molecular targets at the time of recurrence to see if any of our treatments can be used against these targets. So it's interesting, we've changed quite a bit in the last 10 years. Perfect. One question more is, and unfortunately in Latin America and in plenty of countries around there is a lack of access to molecular biology. Uh, so does this change your surgical, do it change your surgical strategy, your surgical procedure in case of, of a lack of, of molecular biology? Yeah, actually the answer is absolutely no. And it's because of the study I just showed you. We were, we were wondering ourselves whether or not, if I knew going into an operation, if a tumor was wild type or mutated, if it was MGMT positive or negative, would I want to be less aggressive with that tumor? And we showed in this article that we published a few months ago, the answer is no that I don't need to know the molecular status of the tumor. I now know that I have to be aggressive with the resection. Perfect. And a last question. I know you are quite busy, Mitch. Uh, well, you're, there cutting, any you're, you're, you're cutting into my cocktail time because it's, <laughs> it's 4.30 in San Francisco. Oh, for sure. Uh, is there any study comparing med to bowl? What's that? Is oh, there and, yeah. Any uh, study comparing MEG MAC to bold? Yeah. Um, no, I don't. Well, there are studies that look at both different techniques. Although I don't know of a study that compares one to the other. We rely on the MEG because, like resting state fMRI, it can show you connectivity in different regions, so that's helpful. We rely on uh, MEG because it's more of a neuronal marker than a blood flow marker. So we think it's, it's been, for me, it's been more accurate and we have both and we've gone with MEG. Perfect. And the last one, sorry. Uh, did you have any case with focus approach where you didn't find a safe brain surface to start the resection? Yes. Yeah, there are a few cases like that where I, I did one uh, about six months ago where I got in, it was in the motor cortex of the leg. I mapped everywhere. I could not find one place uh, other than a very small area that allowed me to do a biopsy, but I could not take out more than a centimeter of tumor in a tumor that was over three centimeters. So that happens sometimes. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. No more questions. I'm really very happy and thanks a lot, Mitch. Sure. for your superb conference. It was really outstanding. And uh, we'll see you in Buenos Aires soon. You have yeah. to, we'll and reschedule, we reschedule the, the meeting and we'll let you know uh, when yeah. and we'll arrange with you. Okay, and in, and in your honor and in your country's honor tonight, I'm going to have a steak. Oh, perfect. Have a very nice steak. I, it, I know. It's not I as good. I know where. As, I know where you're going to have a steak. It's yeah, super. but it's it's not as good as the Argentina beef of that I course, have. Of course, no. We have the best. We have okay. the best steak. Okay. I wish all of you good health and long. Thanks a lot, thank and you. thank you a lot, Mitch. Thanks. Okay, Bobby. Thanks. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye bye. Les quiero decir a todos, los invito a mañana a la conferencia del doctor Dufo a las 12 horas hora eh, Argentina. Uh, así que están todos invitados muchas gracias a los panelistas uh, y muchas gracias al doctor Vaso, al doctor Mariano Sokolov y a Javier Golan por haber coordinado todo uh, y nos vemos nos vemos mañana ¿no?
Abrazo, Gaby, querido. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Abrazo.